I believe that they're already up on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome them with a big round of applause. Good morning. It's an absolute pleasure and honor to be here today, and thank you for joining this session. We've heard a lot about policy this morning, but now I want to shift the conversation back to what's actually happening on the ground, especially what are companies outside of Korea in the region doing in their sustainability efforts. Recently, the uh, McKinsey published a report and found that climate change and sustainability are the sixth most pressing issue facing CEOs at this time. And it's clear that this is at the front of everyone's mind at the moment. We heard yesterday from many companies who are working on climate change, uh, sustainability, but conventionally this has been approached from the perspective of risk mitigation and compliance. But increasingly we are also seeing companies that are taking a different approach and looking at the opportunities that sustainability brings. And that is really the focus of this session today. We want to highlight four companies that are really taking sustainability serious and are implementing innovative solutions. And they are here today to share some of these examples and their approaches. So let me briefly introduce my panelists. Next to me is Jose Lopez, Chief Architectural Designer at MiniWiz, a Taiwanese company that turns post-consumer and industrial waste into construction and consumer products. As an architectural designer with 25 years in the field, Jose specializes on implementing innovative ESG-focused circular solutions. He has been involved with MiniWiz for more than 10 years and driving much of the company's R&D initiatives. Welcome. Next is Victoria Tan. She is the head of group risk management and sustainability at Ayala Corporations. Ayala is one of the most diverse and enduring multi-business groups in the Philippines. Victoria is credited as the driving force behind integrating sustainability across Ayala, aligning the company with the SDGs, and her leadership has seen Ayala win numerous CSR awards. Next, Dr. Karen Bunlarvanic, the Vice President of Casacorn Bank, a Thai banking group. Karen has been with the bank for more than a decade and is responsible for strategic financial planning, balance sheet management, investment portfolio decisions, liquidity management, and financial data analytics. In addition, Dr. Bunlarvanic is also Assistant Professor in the Faculty of Commerce and Accountancy at Chalalongorn University. I hope I said that right. <laughs> and last but not least, Ishan Chan Guo, Chief Brand Officer for Delta Electronics, a Taiwanese electronic manufacturing company. She is also Vice Chairman of Delta Electronics Foundation. Shan Shan first joined Delta in 2010 and has helped organize Delta Global Branding Initiatives and has led Delta to be named as Best Taiwan Global Brand from 2010 to 2020. She has hosted Delta official side events at various COP um, conferences and spoke about Delta's endeavors in technological innovation for energy resilience at COP23. So thank you and welcome all um, to this panel. I would like to invite you all to share a little bit about your company's philosophy around sustainability and share some of the examples that you have, um, are working on. Um, we're going to start, I believe, with um, Victoria, with your presentation. Um, so please, thank you. Hello, good morning. Yeah, it's working. So good morning, everyone. I hope the slide will be up in the screen in a few minutes or in a few seconds. But I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, KCCI and the CAPS organization for inviting me and literally for bringing me here to share our sustainability journey at Ayala Corporation. It's there. So first, just an introduction of who we are. 
uh, founded in 1834, Ayala Corporation is one of the largest conglomerates in the Philippines with business interests in real estate, financing, telecommunications, power, healthcare, logistics, industrial technologies, technology uh, ventures, education, and water infrastructure. For the last 189 years, our portfolio of businesses provide various engine for growth and value creation with the objectives of improving lives and supporting the national development agenda through focused uh, execution, transformation, and leadership in sustainability. Let me move to the next slide. Oh, this slide is our sustainability philosophy that actually supports the value creation process of the group. It is composed of uh, ESG impact management and creating shared value model. ESG are hygiene factors that are increasingly becoming critical or important to our stakeholders. It is a set of broad topics and usually far-reaching, but in Ayala, we decided to focus on three global issues. That Those are the climate change issues, biodiversity loss, and inequality. On the other hand, the creating shared value concept actually allows us to address societal challenges by bringing an innovative model up to a scale and through a viable business financial uh, proposition. So taken together, the philosophy ensures that we remain a responsible organization while positively contributing to the social development goals. The next few slides, I will talk about our climate ambition. So we announced in October 2021 that we are committing to achieve net zero greenhouse gas by 2050. To support this ambition, we engage South Pole, a leading global uh, climate service provider, to help us develop the roadmap for the business unit and also for the parent company. In line with best practice, we will account for our uh, GHG, looking at the six greenhouse gases as outlined in the Kyoto Protocol and uh, going through all the different emissions, scope one, scope two, and scope three. I know you will agree with me that the most complex one is scope three, and we are expecting that scope three will make up the majority of Ayala's footprint. Now, where we are in our climate ambition, and that would be the next slide, uh, here we are in our climate ambition. Two of our core business drivers actually developed their roadmap last year, and that is Ayala Land and the Energy Group. We expect that Globe, our telco company, and BPI, the bank, will also complete their roadmap by the middle of this year. And the rest of the portfolio that I mentioned a while ago will also embark on the same work stream so that we can have a complete roadmap for the parent company. So while we are developing that roadmap, we already have made some strategic decisions in relation to climate. We can cluster the the strategies into three. The first one is around reduction strategy. So with our renew renewable energy platform, we are actually supplying our business units and our customers with RE. We are also encouraging our business units and other uh, businesses to have or to install on-site renewable energy. And we also have a capacity for that. Uh, we are deploying energy efficient uh, measures and other technologies. And one of our companies in Ayala is also uh, has a capacity or developing energy saving devices. And then we are supporting the electrification of the transport sector. And we, I will discuss that in the following slide. And to close the whole reduction strategy, we just acquired uh, two waste management companies last year. 
So the second cluster of strategies around offsetting and carbon capture um, storage solutions, we are still very early in this particular space. But the last one is our investment in nature-based solutions. So we have a project in one of the islands of Luzon. It is a forest protection and biodiversity conservation um, initiative. It is about 32,000 hectares of forest, and it will actually um, uh, benefit 2,500 families. That particular project is employing the UN Red Plus methodology so that we can actually have a good quality carbon for the carbon market. And again, in the, I think in this last... Hmm, wait. In this slide, these are the two initiatives where we think there will be a lot of opportunities for the group. The first one is our renewable expansion in the region. So our ACN or our AC energy platform has wind, solar, geothermal presence or operations in Indonesia, Vietnam, India, Australia. And recently we announced that we will be building a solar power plant in Laos. Uh, ACN is also the first first company in the world to implement an energy transition mechanism for its coal-fired power plant. And then the other sector that we are really supporting is the uh, electric electricity mobility sector. So just like I think we have heard a while ago that there's a lot of installation of EV chargers, we are also doing the same. We installed EV chargers in our uh, estates, developments, projects, malls, hotels, and other buildings. And uh, we are uh, distributing EV6 car from Kia, the first electric uh, a vehicle from Kia. Yes, we are a distributor of Kia in the Philippines, and we see that there's a lot of interest in relation to EV6. And then this year also, we will be starting on our battery swapping initiatives, and that is with Gogoro of Taiwan. And just this week, our chairman signed an agreement with an American company so that we can manufacture electric motorcycles in the Philippines. And I guess all of this is in support of the nationally determined contributions of the country. I've been hearing that since yesterday and just a while ago during the panel. And I realized that our target is so high. The average is about 40, 43, but the Philippines is committing to a 75% GHG reduction and avoidance target by 2030. So all of this is in support of that NDC. And this is also a way of Ayala to make sure that we are protecting the well-being of the future generations of Filipinos. A climate strategy that is aligned with the national strategy will not only benefit Ayala but the entire Philippines as well. I think I have to stop there and I will turn you over to Anala. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And I'd like now, now I'd like to invite um, Kunkaran to speak about um, Casa Corn's um, efforts. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, let's put up the slides. Um, first, I would like to thank um, KCCI and also CAPS for inviting our bank and myself to share what we have done and um, under the themes of opportunities and um, how can uh, uh, banks. We have heard from last panel that um, uh, in Paris Agreement, actually the financial flow is one of the enablers for ourselves to transition to the sustainability uh, uh, economy. So first, uh, before we move on to details, next slide, please. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, on the climate change impact, um, uh, people have talked about the impacts of it. And then um, actually Thailand is ranked number seven uh, based on the impacts from the, the climate-related hazards. Okay. Uh, even though our GDP is actually a lot less than China or the, uh, Korea or Japan, but uh, we are ranked number seven in Asia here. That is why from Thailand's roadmap, I think similar to many countries here, um, we aim to reduce the, the, the carbon um, 40% within 2030 and then reach a carbon neutral in 2050s and then net zeros in 2065. Um, for our bank, um, just a little about our bank here. We are uh, ranked number two in terms of asset size in Thailand with about 125 billion US dollars um, asset. Um, 
our goal here is that because we are bank, we, we do not emit, emit much of the carbon. So our net zero goal will be in 2030 for ourselves. The more challenging, as Ayala have said, is about um, the scope three. And then um, we would like to, to make sure that um, we and our countries and our clients can move together to what that uh, net zero target on the scope three. On um, the, 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 um, the awards, whatever, um, we have one thing I would, I would like to mention is about the DGSI. We are the only one bank actually in Asia in ASEAN that uh, will be ranked within the DJSI world and also DJSI Emerging Index. Okay. Now, if we wanted to get more details here to save the time here. Um, for banks, um, most of the banks, we do the first top part of this picture here, which we call the decarbonization of the lending portfolio. Of, of our lending portfolio of 70 billion US dollars, um, we have to have not only the goals, but how to achieve that. And internally, we call is the gripe part of how can we decarbonize the lending portfolios. And it's like um, any, I would say, 80 20 rules. Um, here, the first top three sectors, um, which are power generation, oil and gas, and coal, for example, even though the lending outstanding is small but it emits a lot of carbon. So these are the three sectors that we targeted and then we try to decarbonize. It means that we try to lend in terms of green lendings with them, um, help them transition to the green economy. And then uh, and that has been done for the past two years. And then for the next few years, we're talking about the next five sectors, which are aluminum, steel, transportation, real estate, and agriculture. Even though the lending side is about just a third, but actually it's emit about two thirds or 61% of the carbon. So we try, we try to decarbonize those lending portfolios seconds in the next few years. And then we try to reach um, the 100% later. So these are what I think all the banks are doing. Okay, here, because of this panel, we talk about opportunities. Um, I would like to emphasize on this page a little bit more. On opportunities, um, people have said about the target goals and, and, and uh, what should we do, but there are some obstacles that all of us will face. The first obstacle is about funding. Okay. Besides typical lending portfolio on the top, <clears throat> our bank <clears throat> set aside another 200 billion bahts, which is about like six or seven uh, billion US dollars there. Um, to fund uh, the green laws or new green initiative for the industries. Um, we try to make also the, the green bonds. Uh, our bank ourselves issued the green bonds many years back to learn about that. And then now we help our customers, our clients to issue green bonds. And we also invest in green bonds so that we can help all the, the fund or the financial flows uh, quite for freely. And also on the third dot of the, or the first one is about the, the, we call the impact funds. We have seen a lot of startups need funding. So we set up an impact fund or green funds to finance. It's like a VC fund focusing on the green initiatives or green technologies to finance those. So the first obstacle is funding. The second is what we call the micro market structures. We have seen this type of problem everywhere that is like chicken and egg kind of problems. For example, like um, motorcycle, EV motorcycle in Thailand. The customers want a uh, cheaper uh, motorcycle price and also a lot of uh, battery swap stations. Uh, the manufacturer would like to see the demand to pick up first before they invest into the swap stations. We see this as opportunities. We have a platform called WhatsApp. And WhatsApp is like the other countries is a is the battery swap station for the motorcycles because in Thailand actually 2025 all the new motorcycles have to be EVs. We have seen that, and then um, it's a chicken and egg problems. And then we as a bank, which has lower cost of funding, we can finance those uh, ecosystems by ourselves. And the third obstacle that we face is knowledge. So. We help the Bank of Thailand and many other regulators to help define what we call the green taxonomies so that the data flows can be, we said, uh, aligned all together. And also, 
uh, avoid the green watching kind of thing or different shade of greens. So we help the governments uh, to define the green taxonomies. And also on knowledge, we have seen that um, we would like our customers to transition, I mean, to, to, actually, uh, to get the cheaper and greener energies, which is the solar uh, energies, but um, we don't want them to be in debt more. Because of that, we actually create a platform called the Solar Plus platform, which means that the bank will own the solar panel of itself, and then we put it on the roof of the customers so that they can enjoy the cheaper energy costs and then the greener energy, but they will not be in debt. So that kind of things um, is what we have done. And then beside the greens and the technologies and the platforms, actually is, um, we cannot um, neglect what we call the social uh, aspect of that. So we try to lend to the small pocket customers more so that they can transition to what the greens kind of uh, lifestyle behavior, those kind of things. And then lastly, we talk about the G or the governance that had, no one has talked talk much about that. We, we make sure that 100% of our lending to the medium-sized enterprise and all the project finance, we have to go on through what we call the, the ESG credit assessment internally so that we make sure that all of our lending or the futures of our scope trees will be in line with what, what we aim for. And in a summary here, um, for us all, I think we have to balance the balance between the technologies and the cost, and also the balance between the short-term um, uh, shareholders, profitabilities, and the long-term sustainable economies, those kind of things. We think that um, uh, it's just the way that the bank can help also the real sectors and the public sectors to transition and to balance these kind of things. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen. It's great to see how um, the bank is going above and beyond what what um, what we often see, um, but also that the need of balancing some of these um, costs and opportunities, something that we'll talk a little bit more about in the discussion later. Thank you. Um, next, I would like to invite um, Shan Shan to speak a bit about um, Delta Electronics. Thank you. And um, first, I would like to thank CAPS and KCCI for inviting Delta to have this opportunity to share how um, Delta focuses on sustainability and turn it into a business opportunity. And uh, first, I would like to uh, introduce Delta a little bit. Delta was founded in year 1971 in Taiwan. And uh, that time was uh, a world oil crisis, an energy crisis similar to what we're facing today. And our founder, Mr. Bruce Chen, thinks that energy saving is really important. So he set our corporate mission as to provide innovative, clean, and energy efficient solutions for a better tomorrow. That stays with us for the past 52 years and we are lucky that we start almost the first day when Delta was established, that energy saving, energy efficiency is one of our most important goals. And our founder is now 88 years old and he's retired, but still goes to office every day. Founders never retire. <laughs> and then what does Delta do? Um, if you have a cell phone with you, there is 30% of chance that there is Delta's passive components in your cell phone. And if you own a notebook, there is 50% of chance that the power adapter is produced by Delta. Mm. And Delta is the world's largest telecom power supplier in global markets. And we also supply power systems for data centers, the most efficient data centers that our uh, panelists from Microsoft mentioned yesterday. And of course, Amazon, Google, those big data center uh, operation companies are all Delta customers. And you can imagine that by increasing the energy efficiency for just 1% for all Delta products, and considering the size of the market, how much energy can we save from that? 
And in, uh, in the 80s, the uh, energy efficiency was as low as 50%. But now, all Delta products, the energy efficiency can be as high as over 96%, 98%. So that's how we think we can contribute energy saving by improving energy efficiency. And um, not just for our products, the founder, Mr. Bruce Chen, once read a book, The Natural Capitalism, which was published in the 1990s. In the book, it says that buildings is one of the potential area that we can save energy. So he led the Delta team to Europe and to Thailand to learn the new green building techniques. And from year 2006, for all the new buildings of Delta across nations globally, we all build green buildings for ourselves and also for our sponsored projects. Up to now, from 2006 to today, we have 32 green buildings around the world. So um, year two, 2015 is a milestone for us. We took this experience to COP21 to share with the world. And um, the world has huge response and they all look forward to have green buildings. And then we re-examine and see this is indeed a good business opportunity. And we started to build a um, business unit, a business group, building automation through a lot of uh, merger and acquisitions and our own product and capabilities. And now using Delta products, you'll be able to get 50 points out of 110 for LEED certification. And it's 80 points out of 110 for LEED certification if we integrate with our partners. And here, um, I would like to highlight two green buildings in this chart. One is our um, headquarters in the United States, in California, who just got the zero energy certification from LEED just this week. And um, another one is called Magic School. It's a donation project to Chen Kong University. And it has been listed in IPCC's AR6, which was reported yesterday, as one of the seven model buildings in the world in terms of energy saving. So um, this is a perfect example to illustrate how it can start from, it started with a goodwill, a good intention to save energy, to protect the environment, but then later on became a very important business opportunity for Delta. In addition to building, we heard earlier the ambassador from Australia mentioned that transportation is the second largest emitter in terms of carbon. And um, Delta is committed into that area. And we started early from year 2008. This is a new area for Delta, but we started from year 2008 and it took us 12 years to get to today, to get break even today. So it really takes patience when you see a mega trend and you see it's important for the environment. Now Delta can provide this uh, power, trans, uh, power trans systems to 70% of the top 20 car makers in the world. And we provide the heart of the EV, the power trans system, not the battery, but the power system. And we were all expecting the uh, rise of the EV uh, cars in the future, but the electricity needs will be a huge burden on the grid. So we also develop um, efficient charging system. By far, we have shipped two million pieces, the chargers for home or for public use around the world. And it's ju not just a charging system, it's an entire energy grid system. You have to keep the energy grid 
to be resilient so that it doesn't bring impact to the uh, power system. So uh, we build energy storage system and smart grid system and energy management and bi-directional charging system. When there is a surge of electricity use, the battery in the car can actually send back the electricity to a building, to your home, to your building, or even to the grid. So we can get a more balanced and more resilient system from that. And um, I would like to share our participation in COPS too. From here you can see that although Taiwan government uh, will be able to join the official negotiations in COP meetings, but Delta Foundation was very um, honored and happy to have the opportunity to join COP. And uh, we started from year 2009, and uh, from then on we have hosted 16 side events, including COP21 in Paris, where um, our founder, Mr. Bruce Chen, hosted this official side event to talk about green buildings. Our CEO and I spoke at German Pavilion. And in the following COP events, we share experiences in distributed energy infrastructure, in EV, and in a lot of uh, practical experiences that Delta can provide the technology so that we'll be able to communicate and share that experience to the world. And finally, I'd like to share our, our participation in global initiatives. Delta joined RE100 uh, by the Climate Group in year 2021 and commit that we will achieve 100% renewable energy by year 2030. And we even go further to commit carbon neutrality by that year. And we also commit by year 2050, all our global operation will be net zero carbon. So with that commitment and our uh, efforts, we're happy to report that uh, we've been uh, awarded and recognized by a lot of uh, uh, assessment institutions, including Dow Jones Sustainability In Index. It's more relevant to in institutional inve investors. We've been picked, um, selected as the World Index for 12 years and had the best score in the industry for the past four years in a row. And also CDP, Carbon Disclosure Project. We got an A grade for the past three years in a row. So that's basically the simple background I'd like to share so far and we look forward to more exchange of opinions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Shan Shan. Um, it's clear that um, um, Mr. Chang had, was very visionary back in 1971, and as a result, you're very much ahead of many other companies um, in this space. So thank you for sharing that. Um, last but not least, I'd like to invite um, Jose to share a bit more about Hello. Mini Wiz. Hello. Thank you. First, um, I would also like to thank KCCI and CAPS for inviting us for this opportunity to share our improvements or the way we try to Accomplish them and accomplish EFC solutions. But first, I would like to tell you a little bit about Minuis, a company that started with started with the idea of creating buildings. But uh, like a car with the latest technology, the latest software. But with the goal as well of having the lowest carbon footprint and made with 100% recycled material. Then, 12 years ago. We created EcoArt, the world's first zero carbon footprint building. And after many patents and achievements, we have, becoming, we have become one of the leaders in this field. In a time where 60% of all, car, all, all global carbon footprint emissions are for the building trade only, embedded in the building as well as in its operation, Minuis a circular upcycling tech pioneer with the sole goal of radically changing and cutting carbon footprint emissions by transforming single-use uh, waste into high-performance building material. And therefore, at the same time, empowering ESG governments and developers. But a little bit of uh, 
a showcase, since uh, sometimes images does more than words. Let me show you a little introduction of what we do. We want to matter. We want to matter to the non-toxic future of our world. We want to matter to the sustainability of our community. At Miniways, it is our mission to change consumer behavior into a circular one. It is the only way for us as a species to sustainably consume our limited resources. Overconsumption is a complex system problem. There is no single miracle cure. We want to matter by proving human consumption can be satiated with our very own trash. We have dedicated ourselves to turning decades of environmental pollution into solutions that will enable us to live sustainably. We want to matter, so we turn ourselves into magicians of trash, inventing new ways of transforming our everyday trash into high-performance works of art. We turn milk packaging into the hottest sportswear fashion, plastic bottles into luxurious textile, cigarette butts into furnitures and glasses, using fashion and apparel waste into luxurious home furnishings, mask, PPE into cell phone chargers, single-use medical waste material into hospitals, using smart AI technology to make decentralized recycling and upcycling possible today. We head to Taiwan for this report, a, a company designing solutions to overcome a mounting problem of a mountain of trash. From furniture to hospital wards, all built from waste, one CEO is on a mission to revolutionize recycling. His team has used waste to develop over 1,200 different materials for use in construction. A company turning different kinds of waste, like plastic bottles, into materials for buildings and products across the world. We want to matter, but unfortunately we are out of time. Please join us in upcycling today's local pollution into circular ESG building solutions of the future. So, um, but how do we do this? How does Miniways do us? Well, we mainly try to focus on three main areas and solely on these three main areas. A, we design with modularity and scalability in mind. So then we consider environmental, carbon footprint, life cycle impacts. <coughs> B, we specify targeting on local building codes and fire and safety regulations. They're therefore ensuring the use and applicability of everything we do. And see, well, sometimes the technology in manufacturing is not there yet. So then sometimes we need to modify existing systems or even create our own machinery. But we focus on all these three and solely on these three because they're all scalable. Machines, data, software, they're all scalable. Therefore, if you see in the chart, we pretty much uh, take of waste from our local management uh, companies, and we turn them into uh, this high-performance building material. And then what we do is we scale it to different markets. And we also collaborate with different creatives in companies like uh, Starbucks or Nike. But why? Because these companies are somehow embedded in the communities it serve. And in order to enable these communities, can, can have a return of value of ESG value, less of ESG value and then less finance value. But with all this formula, you may wonder like what kind of buildings you can come up with this and with restrictions, but it's, this is one of them. The Skywind Pavilion in Bangkok. This is one of the lowest carbon footprint structures there is, covering 2,000 square meters, and it's a canopy, it's a shelter canopy with a, uh, sorry, is a shelter with a pneumatic canopy. And this canopy was made with our special material, let's call it, made out with recycled polyester, which, which we turn into architectural fibers. And then we weave them in a special way so they can withstand local conditions, local, very local conditions, like typhoons or thunderstorms. But this is the result of more than 10 years of data in creating these low carbon footprint materials, and even creating a new construction methods, which we have to go and prove it in, to many entities. We have to modularize the design, modularize the engineering, create these materials. But uh, all in all, 
is, is what the software does. But we have to keep in mind, to reduce carbon footprint, you need to design with the lowest carbon footprint and execute with the lowest carbon footprint. Airside shopping mall. In this case, you might wonder maybe is uh, how the scalability works in this case. Well, in a different way it does because uh, the material you see here is the same material as you saw before, but we downgrade it to a commercial letter for a commercial use. So what we do here is we use waste fabric and turn it into high performance interior finishing covering with an 84% less carbon footprint than using regular standard materials and complying with all the local codes. But yet, this is not the highest certification we got. During COVID, during COVID, it was a special time for us since uh, we had, there was a great opportunity to apply our knowledge and know-how in collecting local material and developing this multifunctional modular system that can turn any regular ward, hospital wards, into a fully operational ICU positive or negative pressure wards and time record. And yet, the certification we got for this is we were able to achieve one of the highest ones in the market, the WHO hospital building standard. Nowadays, we are, um, we are actually on phase four of uh, developing these decentralized is these recycling plants in Middle East and Southeast Asia. But what we're doing here is we are decentralizing our manufacturing locally. Therefore, we're collaborating with governments and companies, usually big companies. But why? Because they usually provide the demand and they also provide the waste. So in a way, what we're doing is we're closing the loop, joining with governments and the existing local infrastructure there is. Like in this case, we were able to achieve 14 UN sustainability developing goals. And with a footprint of less than 2,000 square meters, we were able to save 1,600 tons of CO2 emissions and 250 tons of waste plastic in a year. Therefore, this is one example of how can we take our technology and make sustainability scalable forever with this method. And that was it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's great to see some of these examples and how uh, technology is really playing a role here, something that um, I hope to touch on a little bit more. Um, I realize we don't have a lot of time, um, but I do want to ask um, our guests a few questions. Um, I'd like to start with a theme that we've been hearing quite a lot in the past, or yesterday, as well as this morning, which is government. Obviously, government plays a very important role. Um, Dr. Shapiro yesterday spoke about how gov companies tend to align their work with governments. Um, the government set the playing field, they set the policies and the regulations, but there's constantly shifting goalposts, making it difficult to keep up with everything. Um, I'd like to ask you, What's been your experience uh, in either working with the government or trying to keep up with things? Um, and I'd like to start with um, Kun Karen. Um, what's been your experience? Yeah, I, I think people have, I would like to put this analogy here. Um, people have talked about EV car. Think about car, we think that the real sectors is like a model of the car. And then the government is like the navigators of the car to set the target, set whatever. And then the banking will be the battery of a car to finance that. Okay. And then these three interact together because the government cannot create uh, policies, the right policies, without understanding the needs from the real sector, without understanding what are the challenges from the real sectors. And then the real sectors cannot pursue or move forward without the right financing tools or the right finance from the banks or maybe from the capital markets. And again, for the last one is a bank cannot uh, give the finance without the right data sharing from the real sectors and without the right incentive from the governments. So of these, we think that, um, that we have to set the navigator right, the government policies, and then design the right mechanisms, mm -hmm. such that all the things, the, the, the federal sectors and the private sectors can, can go together. Yeah, so it's really three crucial parts to the puzzle. And 
Victoria, maybe you can um, share a bit. I know that Ayala works very closely with the government. Uh, maybe you can uh, speak Hi. a bit more about that. Yeah, um, just a personal anecdote. When I was hired in Ayala, I was given a book. It is about the 175 years of existence of Ayala. And going to that pages, I realized that Ayala is part of the development of our country. They provided the first rail uh, system from the water, et cetera, and everything else. So anything that touches the human requirements or human needs, Ayala is there. And so in one of the values of Ayala, there is that we, need, we will be supporting the national development agenda with the caveat that we are not taking away the role of the government because it is still the government who are responsible for all the social services and infrastructure for the country. But part of that is we really to have to make sure that we are supporting the national development agenda. And so uh, in all the things that we do, we have to ensure that we are aligned first with the government's agenda and we have to also to realize that the government does not have the capability or the capacity in all the things that's happening around us. So they are uh, coming to the, uh, asking the private sector to help. So a perfect example is during COVID. So they have this interagency uh, task force for COVID. And one of the things that they ask is to, uh, for Ayala to provide uh, um, advices and also to be part of that whole strategy to combat COVID in the Philippines. So it's working with the government. It's something that we have to do because they provide us the enabling environment. An example is in the EV space. That's why there's a lot of interest to get that EV6, the Kia Carnival or the Kia car, because the government is giving incentives. There will be no taxes if you will be buying an EV car. And then we have a crazy rule in the Philippines because of traffic that you, depending on your plate number, you cannot go in the road <laughs> or outside of your house. So, but if you have an EV car, you can go out of your house anytime, any day. So that's actually is a, a something that we are looking forward to. There's still a lot of things that we should work with the government in terms of the climate uh, ambition. And we, I feel personally that our government is lacking behind and we are ready to help them. But just a caveat, we are not taking away the responsibility of the government for the people. Yeah, so it's very much a supportive role trying to, to support your government to do more. And Shan Shan, Delta Electronics works across many um, countries and economies. That must um, pose its own challenges um, or opportunities um, for you working with multitude of governments. Yes, yes, that absolutely agree that the uh, government policy can play a very important role in accelerating the energy transition. And we comply with local regulations around the world, but I would like to give a quick example from Taiwan. In the um, year 2019, uh, the Taiwanese government issued a, a Renewable Energy Development Act, which uh, requires hundreds of uh, companies that are the largest electricity consumption units, the largest emitters, to use 10% of renewable energy out of their total amount. So uh, there is this basic line of 10% that's pushing at every company either to use uh, renewable, build renewable energy or to uh, buy rack or to uh, use storage to, uh, to fit the quota. So it quickly pushes yeah. through. Yeah. Thank you. And I would say in a, a previous conversation with, with um, your founder, we heard that Miniwiz is increasingly working more with governments and, and less with companies. Um, why is that? Well, it's, um, we won't say like less with companies, but it's mostly uh, we work in a little bit more with governments because as, uh, as mentioned by Tintin and also by, by, by Victoria, they, um, they are very important in the process because they help de-risking the market. So therefore, there's more incentives for companies to, uh, to incorporate recycled materials, like in our case, or even an extension of uh, what, Victoria, uh, what Tintin was mentioning. Like in our case, in the building industry, the, uh, um, well, there was a recent uh, update on the building code in which actually 
they are required in order to have a, a green building certification in Taiwan. You need to have at least 60% of the, the, the contents in your building have to have a percentage of recycled content, which is actually is a, is, is really, is a big move because they really de-risk de -risk the market for other entrepreneurs and, uh, and, other, and other companies to actually incorporate and create more ways to recycle material incorporated into the, into the building industry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's a, a great example of how the government is is really driving that space. One other thing that really has come up in in all of the presentations here, um, but I think especially for both of our Taiwan guests, is technology. Um, and yesterday, I heard somebody say that um, the solution to sustainability lies in in technology. Um, and this is particularly, I want to pose this question to both of um, our Taiwanese guests. Is that true? Do you think that technology is the panacea? Is it really the, um, the solution to everything? Well, not everything, <laughs> to, to sustainability. I was saying maybe you would like to start um, here. No, I just wanted to make a, a little comment that actually can summarize my, my, my point of view on this. Is uh, the technology exists. I mean, the science exists. Everybody knows technology. The technology is there, and the technology is not the problem. It's, it's uh, the lack of incentive sometimes. Because uh, in, order to, in order to move ahead in this movement and, and, and getting better solutions, you need to actually use applicability. So you need this technology, you need to have more access to this technology. So a little more incentive to encourage you know, companies or helping companies getting access to the technology or incorporating into the process will help a lot. Okay. Hmm? Yeah. And, and Shen Shen, what about yeah. um, for you? I'll just like to uh, echo what the um, IPCC chairperson, Dr. Lee, said yesterday that uh, there is a very important global climate action is to bring more investment to increase energy efficiency and to build energy infrastructure. And that's where technology plays an important role. And what Delta does is that in addition to the 8% of our annual sales goes to R&D, we now have a new mechanism this internal carbon pricing system, this ICP, and we set our internal carbon pricing at 300 US dollar per ton, which is a very high, uh, relative high compared to other companies. And it was quite incredible to many people say, how did that happen? And the rationale behind that is we make a forecast of the energy price in year 2030, if that's our goal. And um, we, we get this internal pricing of a carbon fee from our business group, and then we invest to more technology development and more technology in energy saving so that it becomes a positive circle that uh, we have a stronger technology to save more energy than they pay less in terms of the uh, carbon fee. So uh, I think it's quite an effective mechanism for our BGs to really move along. Yeah. So more, more de-risking, more investment, more technology. We need to see that, a lot more of that. I, I also want to pose a slightly different question to um, Victoria and Karen. You're both here representing uh, countries that are more emerging economies, uh, which have their own challenges. And in addition to trying to in, um, go on the sustainability and, and net zero, there's also a lot of other challenges that your countries still face. And Karen, you already touched upon this balance of, of, um, of opportunities. How do you balance these things when assisting sustainability issues? I, I, I think um, the, 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 um, there are, I would say, the four P's to consider for the balance. The first is productivity. It means that for any transitions, we need to make sure that all the real sectors, or even us, we know that it's not the additional cost but actually it helps us reduce costs, for example, using the solar energy, for example. And then um, we also looking at it as uh, the, the, to overcome the, the, the competitive advantage. The second piece is about the prosperity. We need to make sure that there's incentive in place and then we finance that so that those who invent the technologies get rewards mm -hmm. so that we can overcome that balance on technologies. And then the third is about people we don't want, as I talked with Ruth earlier, we don't want these kind of transitions such that it creates another inequalities more. 
we would like this whatever initiative that we do to have more inclusivities with people, uh, the small SMEs, those retail small customers, those kind of things. I think that is the third piece that is very important. And then the last one will be the partnerships for the balance. Uh, it's not about our single company. It's not about each sectors, each countries. It means that we have to partner with the other sectors. We have to partner with the other countries so that the technology transfers, the partnership transfers, such that we can balance better. Mm -hmm. So it's the productivity, prosperity, people, and also the partnership that we think that we can help balance those kind of things. Yes. Great, the four Ps. I'll remember those. <laughs> Uh, probably in the case of Ayala, I will go back to our sustainability philosophy, and that is composed of the ESG impact management and the CSB, creating shared value. It is a concept that my chairman borrowed from Harvard, and this is really looking at the societal gaps, and within our capability and resources, we have to come up with a business model, bring it up to scale, and there should be a financial viability in all those uh, 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 initiatives. Otherwise, it will become a CSR and it will not be sustainable in the long run. And this philosophy or thinking actually made us invest in the energy sector because in the early 2000s, that's where the problem of the Philippines uh, was, I think even now, but uh, th that is a conscious decision to support the company, uh, the country in terms of energy. And also we have investment in the education, education sector, again, another societal issue in the Philippines. We have to help the government uh, decongest the public uh, uh, elementary schools. And then, of course, recently, and with the COVID, but we have made this decision in healthcare in 2016. Our healthcare system is so broken. And so these are the things that actually drive us in our investment decision. Part of that is really to make sure that we are improving the lives of the Filipinos wherever they are. Great, thank you. I'm aware that we are um, almost out of time. Um, so I just want to say a few closing remarks um, and, and ask you to um, join me with a final closing remark. Uh, it's very clear from hearing the four um, of you all speak in that there are real opportunities here. And we hope that this session today will hopefully inspire others uh, to to see these issues in that way and to do more. Um, I do hope that um, you will take the opportunity to also speak with our guests and maybe um, learn a bit more directly from them about what they are doing and opportunities that, that might offer your organizations and companies. Um, but before I close, I would want to just ask a very quick question to all of you, and that is, what is your call to action to share with others that are in this space, in this journey, what is their, what is your call to action to them? And I'll just start here, Jose, with you and go down that way. Well, my call to action would be is, in order to find ESG solutions, you have to go back and see yourself first. So then, as I mentioned before, you know, it's just like a simple concept of, to think about reduce carbon footprint. You have to, do everything, design it with a lower carbon footprint, execute with a lower carbon footprint. It's the same thing as uh, cleaning your house. You still do it, you do it yourself first in order to portray it and actually reciprocate that. Okay, thank you. Victoria? Uh, the climate change is not just the issue of the government or nor the private sector. It is the issue of every one of us. So the call to action is let's start uh, loving our planet. Uh, helping it heal, and let's start to do the, low, the transition to the low-carbon economy one household at a time, one company at a time, and one government at a time. And I guess that's the only way for us to solve this global issue of climate change. Thank you. Um, yeah. Karen? Yeah, for me, I think uh, we have to talk about carbon footprint. I, I would like to introduce the word carbon handprint, which means that how can but positive things that we can do to the societies, to the environments, such that uh, uh, we all can create all the carbon handprints together. Yeah. I like that, the carbon handprint. <laughs> Shan Shan. I'd like to give two quotes from my founder. First one is, an enterprise exists in a society 
it's a part of the society. So corporate social responsibility is really important. And the second one is, if you do the right thing, eventually you will make profit. And to answer the question from previous panel, that if you are happy with 10% of business growth, we're happy to report that we had achieved a double digit growth last year. So we That's really neat. like to partner with our uh, Korean friends here. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you all for, for joining me today. It was fantastic to hear all about your company's philosophies and the initiatives you're taking. So thank you very much. And I believe now it's time for lunch. I'm sure you're all excited about that too. <laughs>